So I'm broadcasting from, from Boulder, Colorado. We're expecting our, our first snow on Monday, Tuesday, up to six inches. It's close, it was close to 90 today here. So it's really weird what the, what the weather is doing. Um, I, I was up in the mountains yesterday and found a very, uh, a very beautiful spot of Veritas, very, very green. But by Tuesday, it'll be covered with snow. But we all know in about six months from now, it'll be green again, right? And we may, we may be out of this pandemic state and we may be on a physical pilgrimage. But I think it's so important right now to have the opportunity to be virtual in a spiritual way. And so this is, you know, an experiment. You know, I don't think we've, anybody's done this before. At least I haven't. And so I'd like to start this day off with, and the same way we're gonna start off each day for the next 12 days, which is the ringing of the bells in, at the Hildegard House in Fairport Harbor, Ohio. And then from there, we'll go to Dr. Reverend Shannon Springinger, who will lead us into spiritual direction for, for that day which will then be followed by a Hildegard Speaks video. After the video, we'll have a, a short talk by a theologian or an academic that's been curated by, by Dr. Beverly Kensel. For today, instead of the short talk, we're gonna do a panel with the creators of, of the Hildegard Way and St. Hildegard Speaks with Dr. Beverly Kensel, Dr. Annette Esser, and Dr. Shannon Stringler. Sure. Staring so that, should, that should help give you guys a sense of why this event is happening. And then we're, we're going to invite you to breakout rooms, to one breakout room, to answer some of the questions that, that might be um, given to you. And hopefully, we can use those breakout rooms for more community to be, to be made. And if you feel that you want to have separate breakout rooms within those rooms, um, we can also help facilitate that. So that after every day, there'll be a half an hour of a, of a breakout room. All right, so I am gonna go ahead and, and spotlight our ringing of the bells. Good afternoon, morning or evening, depending on where you're at. And thank you from the entire team at St. Hildegard Speaks Virtual Pilgrimage for joining us as we begin this 12-day journey together. As Michael um, stated, I am coming to you live from the Hildegard House in Fairport Harbor, Ohio. It is the home of the community of St. Hildegard Christian Church, as well as a shrine to this remarkable woman, St. Hildegard of Bingen who was canonized by Pope Benedict XVI in 2012 and named the fourth female doctor of the church in the Roman Catholic tradition. The Hildegard Way in Germany is an opportunity to bring St. Hildegard to the world by inviting you to walk through her land, whether in person or virtually. The Hildegard House here in Northeast Ohio in the United States is an effort to connect ourselves to her sacred space from our corner of the globe. We feel blessed here at the Hildegard House to be able to share uniquely in this formal pilgrimage organized by Dr. Annetta Esser and the filmmaker Michael Conti through the ringing of the bells and the daily opening reflections. This journey is an ecumenical project seeking to draw pilgrims from all walks of life Though Hildegard was a Benedictine nun and deeply entrenched in a Catholic worldview, and this comes through in her visions, Dr. Esser and the panel of scholars throughout this pilgrimage will be sharing diverse ways to look at her music, her art, her philosophy, her theology, and her healings. Hildegard's genius is multifaceted and requires the invested effort of many fields of expertise. She was endowed with a multitude of gifts 
through her mystical experience of the living light far beyond the scope of one field of study. Hildegard never assumed it was by her own accord that she was infused with these extraordinary talents, but always gave credit to God. Hildegard saw herself as a mere vessel called and commissioned by the living light to remind humanity of God's eternal presence from the time of creation, long before human beings walk this earth, to the final judgment, whenever that may be. She used a theological concept she called veriditas, which translated means greening power, to help us understand the divine life force that animates all that exists. It keeps us green in mind, body, and spirit. As we begin our pilgrimage today, we bring the hope of being renewed in veridity in whatever ways we may be feeling dry. A pilgrimage is often described as a journey into an unknown place to learn more about oneself, one's faith, or to show respect and honor to a sacred space. Many set out on pilgrimage looking for miracles, healings, or simply an answer to life's great questions. Why are we here? And what is it God is calling us to be and do? These are questions pilgrims have been asking for centuries. How does walking with St. Hildegard on this Hildegard way help us in this effort? In 2018, I had an opportunity to offer a seminar on St. Hildegard at a Roman Catholic seminary in India. During the question and answer period, one of the priests questioned my devotion to Hildegard and suggested I was focusing too heavily on her and not enough on Christ. To walk with Hildegard is to walk towards Christ. When one delves into her works, it is clear she is always pointing behind herself to the God who created her. She is so important to seekers today, not because she has become an idol, though she is pretty awesome, but because she is an extraordinary witness to her Christian faith. Hildegard was chosen by God to receive a series of divine revelations through her experience with the living light. She was charged with the task of sharing it with us. Write down what you see and hear was the command given to her as she received her visions. Through her experience, she became infused with light and illuminates our pilgrim path today as we discern the voice of the living light in our own lives. Hildegard was a mystic. This is not a unique call. Each one of us is called to this mystical relationship if we are open to it. A pilgrimage helps open our minds and hearts to a reality deeper than what is immediately evident. As a mystic, Hildegard saw God's divine presence in every particle of the created world. And she leads us towards a holistic awareness that can help us grow in right relationship with divine order that governs all that exists. As we venture out today on the Hildegard Way, our hearts long to know the mysteries of faith. So many questions we are carrying regarding creation, the fall, the incarnation of Christ, redemption, and the final judgment. I believe these truths were revealed to St. Hildegard through her mystical encounters with the living light. There is an authenticity to her writings and visions even those that are a bit difficult to decipher, that call me on a deep subconscious level. And I imagine they're calling to you as well. To be a pilgrim is to surrender to a force greater than ourselves. Hildegard used the image of being a feather on the breath of God. This is a state we are all called to. Though it's hard to feel feather-like strapped to an electronic device, 
A virtual pilgrimage is not without its challenges, and you may be feeling a bit awkward with it this morning, or this afternoon, and I can assure you, so are we. Yet Hildegard's spirit and charism cannot be tempered, even in the midst of a pandemic. She continues to inspire us to make practical contemporary applications of the revelation she received as we grow in our own understanding of who God is, why we are here, and how the living light may be calling us to renew veriditas or greenness in our own self as well as those we encounter. Hildegard had many followers in her lifetime as well as today. One of her greatest fans was a monk, Hebert, who also served as her personal secretary near the end of her life. Around the year 1176, the monk Ebert wrote Hildegard a letter informing her that a man named Seeger would be making a pilgrimage to Rupertsburg. Rupertsburg was Hildegard's monastery built on the land where St. Rupert was buried. I have asked Reverend Peter to read from this letter as we prepare to begin our journey today because I feel it captures the essence of our desire to encounter Hildegard's companionship as we make our way along this pilgrimage. We bless the God of heaven who has not despised our times and through the radiance of your splendor has put throughout the darkness of this world, lest our generation lack a miracle of virtue or a model of future glorification. The Holy Spirit has miraculously illumined you with visions inspiring you with the means of expounding them and with the pure judgments, wholly consonant with our Catholic faith. And through you, he has revealed the hidden secrets of his wisdom to his little ones in various ways. Through the grace of God, you have become his chosen vessel, dear to God, pleasing to the angels, indispensable to men, and beloved to those who direct the feet of others onto the path of life so that they might learn the magnificence of God's eternal power. For they understand that the female sex has been divinely honored through the sacred merits of your excellence. And they see your glory, the glory of a woman given new life by the Father, full of grace and truth. Hail therefore, lady full of grace. After Mary, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women and blessed the speech of your mouth which conveys the secrets of invisible things and couples the heavenly to the earthly and joins the divine to the human. Believing this with our whole heart, we confess with our mouth that you are the fountain of gardens, the well of living water that flows from Libanus. We earnestly bless you in the name of him who has made you such a one. Turn the streams of your learning to the profundities of our queries and pouring forth a cup of life to our desires, infuse our thirsting spirits with the sober inebriation of the spirit. Know, beloved lady, that your intent scrutiny of this abstruse matter will be pleasing to us above thousands of gold and silver. Your beloved son, our brother, Sijer, is here with us and marvelously freed has heeded your counsel and announced his contempt for the glory of this world. He's preparing to make a devout pilgrimage once again to the sweet breasts of your consolation. Through him, we in our humility send our greetings to you in the love of Christ and commend ourselves to your holy prayers with full devotion. Furthermore, we beg wholeheartedly that you send back the responses to our questions through him as an envoy. We await the reply to our inquiries with the joy of exaltation. Now for the glory of Christ and the profit of the whole church, ponder diligently and send forth your response so that the expression of thanks and the voice of praise will resound from generation to generation. Like Seeger, we are about to set out to make a devout pilgrimage to the sweet breasts of consolation Hildegard offers, as we commend ourselves to her holy prayers with full devotion and journey along as a pilgrim people.
And so we pray. Good and loving God, you call us here together on this journey to grow in knowledge, wisdom, and grace. May our efforts be guided and sustained by your living light. As we journey along with our sister, St. Hildegard of Bingen, may the words and images you revealed to her touch our own souls as deeply as they did hers. May our dryness of mind, body, or spirit be restored by your abundant veridity. We ask all of this in your holy name. Amen. We will now watch a video. What do I think about Hildegard of Bingen? And why do I wish to go for a pilgrimage on the Hildegard Way? These are the first questions for pilgrims at the beginning of the Hildegard Way. Hildegard of Bingen has been called seeress, composer, physician and prophetess. She lived in the 12th century in the land of the River Nahe and in Bingen on the Rhine in the middle of today's Germany. Even though Hildegard already gained fame in her life, it was only 833 years after her death that in 2012 she was canonized and promoted as Doctor of the Universal Church. She received this honor only as the fourth woman amongst more than over 30 men. I am Dr. Annette Esser. I'm a theologian and teacher of art and geography, by the way. So I've been working on Hildegard for 27 years. I've studied in Germany and America, so I'm, this is all my perspectives. I'm looking at Hildegard, I'm also from that literature coming from these different languages in German and English. After receiving my doctorate in theology at the Catholic University of Nijmegen in 2007, I founded the Skevias Institute for Art and Spirituality together with other theologians, artists and psychotherapists in Cologne. Thereafter I moved to the home of my maternal family in Bad Kreuznach near Bingen. When we heard about that Pope Benedict XVI's plan to promote St. Hildegard, we were very excited about this. Thus, in October 2012, we organized an international conference in Bingen with lectures and workshops in order to celebrate Hildegard. Now we are going to put our hands here and feel a bit this resonance going up and down. So, leave the resonance to go up. Myself, I got more and more moved by Hildegard, and I made a sculpture from clay, according to a description in a letter by Abbess Tengswich of Andernach to Abbess Hildegard of Bingen. It shows the saint as a virgin with open hair, a bridal rest, the Lamb of Christ in the front, 
and crosses to the side and the back of the head. The idea was when I went on the Camino Santiago in Spain to have such a pilgrimage route here in the land of Hildegard. I have initiated that and it was like running into open doors everywhere. Everyone thought that was a good idea and many people already had the idea to uh, have a Hildegard way because this is such a beautiful landscape but it is rarely known. We followed this up as a project organized by the local Naaland Tourism and supported by the European Union. And on September the 9th, 2017, we successfully opened the new Hildegard of Bingen pilgrimage route, the Hildegard von Bingen Pilger Wanderweg at the Dizzy Bodenberg with sisters from St. Hildegard's Abbey. Oh, quam mirabilis, oh, how wonderful. With these words of Saint Hildegard that we also will hear as a song, I welcome you very much. It is three years ago that I was sitting in my kitchen with Annette Esser, having a cup of coffee and talking about a heartfelt wish to create a pilgrimage route in the land of Saint Hildegard, the Hildegard way. We were both enthusiastic. Our only question was, will others be there too? For of course, one can dream about many things, but one can never realize this alone. And I have to admit that at the very beginning, when we came up with our idea, many nodded friendly and said, OK, go on with it. But in the course of the three years, one could notice that enthusiasm was growing. Wherever we came, there were people who said, oh, this is wonderful, I join in, this is super. This was just what we needed. We are here in the land of Hildegard, and we do this together. In the name of our mother, Dorothea Flandera, the 40th successor of St. Hildegard and abbess of Rupertsburg and Eibingen, and the whole convent of St. Hildegard Abbey, I also wish to kindly greet you to the presentation of the Hildegard of Bingen pilgrimage route. It is a wonderful sign of openness and awareness for the spiritual experiences in nature that today this Christian tradition of pilgrimage walking is booming and gaining enthusiasm again. This is just that which has coined the theology of St. Hildegard, her theology of creation, in which she shows how much God is present and can be experienced in ourselves, in our environment and in the whole world. We regard it as a great gift that now this sacred spiritual teaching can also be experienced in the Hildegard of Bingen pilgrimage way. The new way is a true enrichment for the Hildegardian cultural landscape at Rhein and Nahl. And according to our tradition, it offers an outstanding opportunity to bring Hildegard of Bingen, her life and her work, close to people and perhaps even to make one or the other experience with oneself or with God.
Yes, I'm very pleased that this is happening today. We, that is in Ireland Tourism, and me as initiator and also as a foundress of the Skivias Institute, now also wish to offer pilgrimage tours on these ten stages of the Hildegard Way. Of course, everybody can walk as much and wherever he or she likes to, for a day, half a day, a weekend, a week. But in future, we will also offer to once walk the whole way. We also offer these tours for groups who come from abroad, international groups. It is also important for us that the tableau of the Hildegard Way are written in German and English language, for we know that there is an international interest in Hildegard. We will offer these things. This route leads in 10 stages over 140 kilometers from the rocky mountains of Ida oberstein through the Nahe River Valley to Bingen on the Rhine, and finally across the river to St. Hildegard's Abbey. Most people who look for Hildegard, who search for Hildegard, go to Bingen or to the Dizzy Bodenberg, and that's about it. And they don't know the historical sites like Sponheim, the monastery, the castle where Hildegard probably was brought in the age of eight. And um, a lot of historical things are, have been reviewed over the last 20 years and we had to re re rewrite the history of Hildegard. So when I thought of, of the Hildegard way in the whole, I thought of going to all those historical sites, but also to follow thinking about meditation to really follow Hildegard herself, not to think about what I think about Hildegard, but what Hildegard really thought was important. The first book that made her famous worldwide is the Liber Scivias, the book Know the Ways. I mean, that is really appropriate for a pilgrimage to think of how to know the ways and, you know, to know the ways. And in this book of Hildegard, there are 27 visions which are not just some uh, assembled by just by chance, but they follow a systematic order from creation to incarnation uh, through the um, last judgment. It is a really a systematic theology and spirituality in images, in visionary images. So in the Hildegard way, really we follow this Libaskivias with the 27 visions, starting at Ida Oberstein, and the last one will be in Stromberg then at the uh, St. Jacob's Church uh, with the final judgment. We are following Hildegard's Libaskivias and at each of these 27 tableaus there is a question for the pilgrim to think about. What do I think? Why am I on the Hildegard way? What do I think the cosmos is? Where is man in the cosmos? What is the origin of evil? What has also been there before creation? What do I think about a good community or the church should be like? And what do I think of all this time of us in being? And will there be a last judgment or last justice for all of us? What is happening on earth in this way? So really we are following Hildegard's own thoughts, which is sometimes very heavy. But I try to put it in a way that it is not just for kind of already believing Christians, but really for all who are kind of searching on the way. Also for all kinds of secular people or for people who are interested in Eastern meditation, but of course also for Christians, for Catholics and for Protestants. This is an ecumenical project. But by the way, 27 visions and also 31 tableaux on the historical sites and all the works of Hildegard, which include her Liber Physica, with all the books on herbs, on trees, on fish, on birds, on animals, on stones, on reptiles, on metals. This is also very important, and her art of healing in the Liber Causa et Cure. So, it's really, this is historic sites and works of Hildegard. To discover it's a land of Celts, to discover that the earth of Sponheim were very important in this landscape. And now, 
more and more pilgrims come here to the land of Hildegard at all times of the year. We are on an international pilgrimage and um, so there are people from America, from Ireland, from South Africa. I've been with pilgrims from Korea, from Canada, from Brazil and they come here to people who have hardly heard and learned anything about Hildegard. They might have heard that there are these spelled products which are more popular now, Dinkel, and they might have heard that Hildegard does something on the art of healing, but they don't know, so maybe fennel tea or, you know, very, very simple things. That's what they know about Hildegard. And they don't know, they know maybe Hildegard has lived here, but really it's not so much knowledge. And then they encounter Americans who have studied her works, have really read it, know how to sing the music spontaneously. It's a real surprise for people here that people from so far away come here just to get to know something on, uh, on Hildegard in her own land, in her own homeland. So people here who live in these little villages are surprised. And I think Americans are surprised that people here know so little about them. But, you know, one interesting encounter I had was an American professor of music. She knew how to sing Hildegard songs and we were there at the foot of the Dizzy Bodenberg meeting a man who told us that his grandmother still told the story about the day when Hildegard moved in with Jutta uh, to uh, enter the Dizzy Bodenberg uh, monastery. That this story with all her people on horses and, you know, all this story was told over centuries, so there's still an oral tradition. That was also a surprise for all of us to find out about. In the hot summer of 2019, we decided to also make a series of videos on the stations of the Hildegard Way, to which I had written text. The idea of, of the videos is really to give um, not a description of history and facts, but to put Hildegard and what she thinks about that part of her homeland into a picture. So I wrote nine texts on when Hildegard speaks herself, and that comes out of all my knowledge working on Hildegard. So I write as Hildegard speaks herself about the land where she is. She speaks on stones and the heavenly Jerusalem and so on. Or she talks about her entrance in the Dizzy Bodenberg or the foundation of the Rupertsberg. So we show pictures of that landscape. So this is really for meditation. This is for reflection. This is for the pilgrim who wants to come or has been here and wants a little bit more about it. And to show this beautiful landscape here, the beautiful area where she lived and everything which is here trees and fields and rocks and rivers and vineyards and to show that in combination of what Hildegard thought. So it's more spiritual, imaginative than a, 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 a dry documentary. <laughs> With this film and its 10 videos, we invite you now for a journey to the land of Hildegard. We invite you to listen to the story of her life. Welcome to the Hildegard pilgrimage. was uh, a great introduction to this 
uh, mega event that uh, you've been such an integral part of. Um, I'm going to be a as brief as I can be. I thought I'd just start by introducing myself. Uh, I uh, am uh, a medievalist and I uh, work primarily on uh, religious culture of the, of the Middle Ages. And I've had a long interest in uh, the way people were held to be and to be declared to be saints in the Middle Ages. And uh, this, this was uh, one of the uh, several factors that drew me to the study of, of Hildegard. Uh, I was fascinated to, to see just how uh, such a powerful figure uh, with uh, a very clear following uh, among uh, uh, Christians in her time and afterwards, uh, why it took so very long for her to be canonized. In fact, uh, her canonization process is uh, the very longest one in the history of the Catholic Church. Uh, no one has had to wait so long, so to speak, to, to be declared a saint as, as Hildegard. And on top of that, uh, as Annette mentioned at the beginning of uh, her video, and uh, Shannon did as well, um, uh, Hildegard has the, the rare uh, uh, title of Doctor of the Church. Uh, there are only 40 or so. Uh, in total, and of them, only four are women. So we're dealing with an exceptional person here. So my interest in canonization and uh, uh, doctorization uh, has been uh, a major factor for me. And also, I got to get to know uh, Hildegard much better by peeking over the shoulder of uh, Beverly Kingsley in uh, her many research projects uh, working on Hildegard, especially uh, her collaboration with Carolyn Musig on uh, the editing and eventually the translation of Hildegard's gospel homilies. Um, so that's how I got here talking to you today, uh, but I, th I thought it would be useful for me briefly to ask before passing the baton back uh, to Michael to uh, ask uh, each of uh, the other three participants uh, how they got their start uh, with Hildegard. In particular, I thought I would begin by asking Shannon, uh, do you have, is it the case that Hildegard has been a part of your uh, cultural or spiritual life since for as long as you can remember? Or do you have uh, a recollection as to when you first uh, had your in, uh, initial encounter with Hildegard? Um, thank you. Uh, yes, I have a very clear uh, recollection of when I met um, St. Hildegard. Uh, so I spent um, nine years, I have three uh, graduate and postgraduate degree from the diocesan seminary. And so in uh, 2010, I took a brief leave of absence from the program uh, to really discern my own call. Um, I had felt a call to ordination and being a Roman Catholic minister, that was a conflict of interest. And, and so I had gone out kind of on my own little uh, sabbatical, if you will. And um, when I returned to the program, I chose to write my, my doctoral dissertation in the seminary on uh, the leadership, the kind of a historical overview of the way women have functioned in leadership roles in the history of the church. So this would have been about 2010. And in my research, I came across Hildegard and absolutely fell in love with her. Um, she was one small piece of a much bigger historical survey, and so I um, wasn't able to give her the attention that I um, really had wanted to. Uh, but I completed that program and immediately went into a PhD program and really just invested um, the rest of my work since 2010 in studying St. Hildegard. Uh, my PhD work is in ethical and creative leadership. And I really saw and see St. Hildegard as a, uh, a creative force to kind of bring women more into a, a visible and formal leadership role in the church. And 
Um, I just, uh, like I said, about 2010, I met her, felt crazy in love with her. I've been to Bingen four times, twice by myself on my own pilgrimages. Um, I've gone once with my family, and then I had the opportunity to go last year on uh, the pilgrimage led by Dr. Annetta Esser. Uh, she did mention it was hot. It was one of the hottest <laughs> weeks I think I've ever experienced, but it was really a, a profound um, experience, and I was just so honored to be there. Um, I did have a group ready to go this year. We were supposed to be getting on a plane on Sunday, but clearly we're not going because of the COVID. Uh, so this is a uh, you know the next uh, next best thing to being there. But yeah, so 2010, I met her, fell in love, and she's really been my whole life ever since in terms of studies. That's marvelous, and clearly more than just studies, too, Shannon. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I live and breathe her, <laughs> and I love her letters. I, I fell in love with her letters. We read from a letter from Gieber, um at the beginning, um, but I found that her letters are, there's not as, not, uh, as much uh, emphasis on her letters. Um, it, when people do come across her works, they do become familiar immediately with Scivias and, and some of her uh, healing texts, but her letters often um, are... Um, not paid as much attention to, and I really feel her character comes out, whether it's a little bit of it's embellished later, you know, later on by, um, by her redactions or not. It's just her personality, I think, really comes through in her letters, and so I really fell in love with her letters. I'm really glad you mentioned her letters, uh, Shannon, because uh, I think inevitably, no matter who the writer is, a letter is a window into the soul of the person. And uh, with the case of Hildegard, we have several hundred uh, mm -hmm. windows to look in. Uh, right. And uh, there's lots you can say, as you mentioned, with regard to, to her and her letters. Uh, not least that she communicated with all levels of society. Uh, and it's not just letters to and from nuns or to uh, curious priests who might have some spiritual or theological questions. She dealt with everyone from uh, the highest ranks of the church and the empire to the most humble uh, local citizens. Uh, so to see, reading her letters gives you a, a great insight, not only into her soul and to her uh, approach to so many different topics, but uh, to uh, the society of her time. It's fascinating. Absolutely. I see them much the same way St. Paul wrote his letters. You know, she was dealing with practical pastoral issues. I love her letter correspondence from Gebert. There's many more than the one we read today because he had a minor obsession with her. But at the same time, um, I, you do really just get a sense, I think, of her personality. And she was right. a character. That comes out in her letters. <laughs> oh, yeah. Big time. <laughs> Well, Thank thanks, you. Shannon. I thought I'd ask uh, the same question to, to, to Beverly. Uh, um, do you have, uh, Beverly, a, a, a kind of eureka moment uh, with regard to your encounters with Hildegard, or uh, has she been a familiar friend to you uh, for all these years? Well, uh, I think I have more years than everyone else, <laughs> I always say. All these years are the years that I've been with her, but I also had more years without her. But I discovered her, um, my Eureka moment was finding out, after I found out about her, finding out that she wrote homilies and that the text of some of the letters are actually the written text of an oral, let's call it a sermon, that she delivered somewhere. And um, with my background that you share in medieval preaching and sermons, I was so excited because just about everything is written about men, as you know. And um, Carolyn Music and I have been trying to change that. <laughs> And uh, so I was just wild. I remember running outside telling people it was as if I had discovered gold outside my office. <laughs> <laughs> I was very, very excited. And um, I, so that, that was the Eureka moment. And then I found out what it took to do something with those homilies. Um, 
when I looked at them, I thought, oh, gee, this Latin isn't hard, but what is she talking about? <laughs> and um, that took quite a bit longer to figure out. And then, um, then there was making the edition, and I was very fortunate to have Carolyn joining as a co-editor, and then to have you, I can't think of anyone better to have looking over your shoulder when you're working on a manuscript, George. So um, that was a, a big step. And after doing that, I thought, geez, I had to translate some parts of them already. So I, I should get the translation out right away before someone else has the idea to use the edition and translate the homilies. And then I found out that I had done so much work that I should write a book about it. Um, and on and on it goes. So I have a, a new book coming out, Hildegard of Bingen, comma, gospel interpreter, where I develop even more themes and aspects that I find in her homilies on the gospel than I did before. And I, well, and I've also experienced her in a more deeply spiritual way. So I'll, I'll leave the rest of that for one of my talks. Thank you. Thank you, Beverly. Uh, I'll just fill in one tiny blank that uh, some of our viewers may not uh, know. And that is that you have brought to your work on Hildegard, not only uh, your magisterial knowledge of, of, of Latin, uh, but uh, you have been uh, for many years, uh, a specialist in medieval sermons and preaching. Uh, and in fact, you uh, served as president of the International Medieval Sermon Studies Society. Um, so your work on Hildegard is exceptional, uh, not simply because of the quality of your work, but as a major part of that quality, it's the cultural and intellectual scholarly baggage that you've brought into that. Uh, that's what really makes uh, your work on Hildegard so uh, amazing. And uh, I do, and it's also, dare I say it, uh, apart maybe from the Latin edition for some people, uh, your work is incredibly accessible. So uh, I do urge all of our, our viewers to, to look up your bibliography and especially to to check out uh, your, your soon to be published book. Enjoy it. Uh, Annette. Uh, yes. Unlike the rest of us on this mini panel, uh, you have obvious roots to uh, the land of Hildegard. Uh, I'm wondering, a bit like the anecdote you told of the local folklore in which it's clear Hildegard still really lives uh, among the people in the area. Uh, do you have a sense as to uh, how long or when you, you first recall having Hildegard as a part of that, that cultural aura, that cultural belonging uh, that, that you so clearly demonstrate in, in the video that we've seen and admired. Yes, I mean, my maternal family is from this land of Hildegard. My aunt was a teacher in Bingen for many years. Oh, yes. right. And of course, I knew about Hildegard, but not so much. So when I studied theology, I wrote my thesis on Santa Teresa de Jesus, Saint Teresa. Oh. Um, I was much more fascinated by Teresa, and I thought Hildegard was a bit more German and boring in comparison. <laughs> And then my aunt, who was a teacher there, she said, oh, Annette, why don't you do something on Hildegard? And I thought, well, she's a mystic too. And uh, hmm. the first thing I was thinking was interesting was her visions. And as I'm coming from the arts as well, I, for me, the approach is to her, through her visions. And then it happened that I was offered to translate a book by Barbara Newman, which is actually the first monography in the English language I think on Hildegard. 
I did that work for two and a half years and I was really amazed that an American woman would have read the, the dissertations on Hildegard of the 1930s plus reading Latin. And um, I had to revive my Latin also by translating Barbara Newman. And that was a very big learning. And I did that before I went to America in 94. And there I gave a lot of lectures on Hildegard in 98, which was the year of Hildegard's birth in German and English language in New York, which was very surprising to do it in German as well there. And since these 24, 12, five years, I've worked on Hildegard and got more and more involved. And it is, for me, it's this very special kind of calling to talk about Hildegard here. In the land of Hildegard, people are more interested in her art of healing made, uh, and in, you know, these kind of things. But they don't know so much about, uh, maybe also the history, the question where, she, where was she born and where was the women's cell of the Dizzy Bodenberg? And did she really found a second monastery in Eibingen? These are the questions that people are concerned about here. And, very, and there's a lot of Hildegardens. I'm, I'm getting calls, how do we create a Hildegarden here with her herbs and stuff? This is the kind of things that people are interested but not so much in her music as in America, I think, and also not so much in her theology. And as I'm a theologian and artist, that's what I brought here to the land of Hildegard and also to the Hildegard way, because there we have all the 27 visions now, the Libaskivias, and it's, it's a really a new one for people here. And that's fascinating and, and really, as I said, it is a surprise for them to know that the rest of the world is really interested in this. And the city of Bingen was really asleep, I have to say, since 2012, when Hildegard was canonized and promoted as doctor of the church, suddenly they think, oh, we should do something about her here in her homeland. But that's really rather new. So I'm that's very excited. That <laughs> yeah. is absolutely fascinating, Annette. Uh, uh, <laughs> I had the, the impression that you were uh, bringing to the world uh, what was already deeply and profoundly felt throughout uh, your region in Germany. And to, to see that, in fact, uh, in terms of a broad uh, spiritual and intellectual interest, that this is all very new. It's, it's a real mark of viriditas, isn't it? Yeah. This yeah. is the, yeah. the evergreenness of Hildegard that uh, like, like so many plants goes into relative states of hibernation, but then boom, they flower and they fill the air with their scent. And uh, yeah, that's absolutely. Yeah. And also to discover that Hildegard is kind of a green saint, I mean, in terms of <laughs> environmental right. questions. That's interesting for politicians here suddenly as well, um, because it's really, it's so complete and it's, it's holistic and it, it really has to do something with the issues of today, which are, we are concerned about the environment, about climate issues and, and, and really Hildegard gives answers that are of a big surprise and uh, very recent, very actual, I mean, questions of our time of today. That, right. So it's really fascinating. Yeah. Well, we're we are deeply indebted to you, Annette, for for making this known to us and to throughout the world through your yeah. your academic and uh, your scholarly related work in this way. We, we can you. all all we can say is danke. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank yeah. You. Well, I, I will take my my leave now and pass things back uh, to Michael to lead us on uh, in, uh, in this wonderful event. Michael. All right, well, I'm, I'm back. I, I was hoping you were gonna ask me that same question, so I could, ah. uh, so go ahead and ask the question of me too. You know, Michael, I've always wondered. I've always wondered. No, uh, it's, I, I have wondered. Uh, we, we, we are here today because of you, more than anything else. And uh, did, did you have a personal meeting with someone who introduced you to, uh, to Hildegard? Uh, did you discover Hildegard on your own and then think, 
this is amazing, I need to meet uh, experts in the field. Uh, what was your, your itinerary, your pilgrimage? Well, that's, uh, so thank you, for, <laughs> thank you for asking me that question. It's a great, it's a great story that I think um, for me as, a, as from a, my own spiritual growth, I was, I was here in Boulder and I was being asked to videotape um, by Susan Evans, who was bringing Matthew Fox to Boulder and Matthew Fox was doing part of his, his teaching, the, the Via Transformativas. And in the Via Creativia, um, he kept mentioning St. Hildegard. And so I, I really didn't know who she was. I, I was aware of her, her work from Judy Chicago's piece, um, with the table setting of all these, these famous women. And I may have seen one of her visions as a art history major, but I, you know, I didn't know that much about her. And I ended up going on a retreat to, to Bingham with Susan Evans. And it was kind of a creativity retreat. And it was the first time I had really like taken the time to, to sit with myself and kind of explore my own artistic expression and, and look, at, look at things. And that, that experience, um, specifically going to the reliquary and, and being in the presence of, of St. Hildegard, triggered in me in a positive way that, that connection I had had in my early 20s when I had gone to Europe and I was in Barcelona and I was kind of going through that existential crisis of, of you know, what's my purpose of being? Why am I here? And, and at that point in my early 20s, I decided to pursue a life of creativity. And I felt there was like this stream, you know, I had a choice of jumping into the stream of, of a creative life. And I could either go in with my toe, or I could fully like immerse my whole body into it and be swept away and then see what I came out of. Well, I, you know, I had kind of forgotten about that experience until I was in, in the, the shrine in Ibingham. And it, came over me again this this sense of like there's a river like flowing through and this this person had jumped into it as well and you know I really felt this connection to this power that she possibly that I was just barely touching but she had immersed herself into and that kind of became this exploration afterwards of um, I did an interview with Matthew Fox when he was over in Germany. He came to, to our event. Um, he will be speaking with us. We'll be having a conversation with him on, on day 12, the feast day. Um, it's such an honor to be able to, to just recognize that he brought her um, to a lot of Americans consciousness and with some of, with his books in the 1980s through Little Bear. And then, you know, he's published three more books or two more books since then, which are, which are a really great way to kind of get an entry into her writings. So that, that first experience then kind of has led me on the path to where I am. And if you remember, I met you in 2015 at right. the Harvard Divinity School when Beverly asked me to come and show The Unruly Mystic there. So I actually made a documentary called The Unruly Mystic St. Hildegard, which came out in 2014. And we've been showing that um, ever since and September has always been a really special month because we'll show the film and then do a feast day with it. And last summer we were with, um, we were with Shannon in Ohio and we showed it, showed it there. So this is now kind of a progression of that. So I, I think what, where I'd like to just leave it that I see her as a patron saint of creativity and that I see her as a really as a touchstone for all of us to connect to our, to our own mystical abilities and the powers that are innate in all of us and to really kind of step up and shine like Hildegard, Hildegard shines. And I think it's so important that we do that today in this, in this crisis that we're in and in the crisis that will continue to follow. And the fact that we're speaking about somebody who actually did something of value, right? 850 years ago, and that we're putting energy into that really kind of tells you where you know, where society has kind of gone in a lot of ways. Um, you know, we're so in the moment, but if we look into the past and look into people like St. Hildegard and bring that and continue to bring that energy, that veritas into our existence now, there is the potential to just really kind of unsolve problems and, and create a, a, a platform for people to feel positive and move, move forward. 
and you've done that with great success here, Michael. Uh, uh, as I said earlier, we really are in your debt. And um, um, yeah, uh, this is the beginning of an unfolding that will proceed over the next uh, 12 days. And not just that, but for long, long afterwards, uh, thanks to the work that you and so many people have put into not just this project, but into uh, pondering, writing about, thinking about, talking about uh, the life and thought of, of Hildegard of Bingen. So thanks very much, Michael. And now I will turn it over to you. Okay, all right, so thank you. Thank you, and then thank you to everybody who's been participating. And, you know, Shannon said at the beginning, you know, this is kind of a, a, an unusual, well, we don't really know where this is gonna turn up. I mean, this is so, and I think we're also open to your input if there's things we can do to, to help. And, um, you know, there's a process that we've set in place. And as we know, for those who have done pilgrimages, you know, things can happen. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pass this back to Shannon and um, the goal would be now for her to kind of pr provide some questions that you may have. Um, I'm also going to ask, too, if you have any questions of the panelists, please, um, when you go into the breakout rooms, and we're not forcing you into there, it's just a, it's up to you to, if you want to go and join. Um, some of the panelists may be in the breakout rooms. You can ask some of your questions of them. Um, you can also provide, uh, you know, a, a, a comment or a chat question, and then we can, we could feed them back, feed those back to them. So, um, so with that, I'll say, Goodbye to you for from me today from Boulder. Pass it to Shannon. And I'll see you again tomorrow at, at noon Eastern time. And please invite other people to join us. It's I think it, I think we all need this right now. Thank you, Michael. So as Michael mentioned, you do have an opportunity at this point if you would like uh, to break out into small group conversations. If not, you certainly um, can. Uh, leave the Zoom room at this time and, and we'll look forward to seeing you again tomorrow. But if you would like to stay on, I believe Michael will have the uh, room open, the breakout rooms, I think we're calling them the anchorage rooms. Uh, Hildegard was an anchorite and so an anchorage would be a small cell where she would have spent her time uh, reflecting and praying and so we'll take a little time in our own uh, digital anchorage rooms. Uh, to kind of talk with each other, get to know some of our uh, fellow travelers, uh, if that's something that you feel called uh, to do. At the very beginning here, I think the question that uh, we just would like you to, to take into these uh, rooms and into the next 12 days is, and, and Dr. Annetta mentioned it in her um, beautiful video, is what is it that you're hoping um, to get from being on this Hildegard Trail? Uh, maybe the questions that the panelists were just asked, what brought us to Hildegard, how did we get to know or meet Hildegard, um, is maybe probably the best question to ask or to talk about today is, is what brought you here today? Um, is Hildegard somebody who has been a part of your life for many years or have you recently come across her uh, through um, an experience or through, through somebody uh, who has shared her uh, charism uh, with you? And so, um, as you go into your uh, rooms, uh, be prepared if you're comfortable to share uh, maybe a little bit of your own history with St. Hildegard uh, and what you're hoping to get out of this pilgrimage uh, experience. Uh, you should receive, I believe, an invite on your screen uh, that will say the host is inviting you to a breakout room. Uh, if you, like I said, if you choose to go into it, just click the button. If not, you can go ahead and exit out of Zoom today, and we'll see you again at noon tomorrow.